Hi, everyone. Well, thanks for sticking around. We will bring this home. And what better way to bring it home uh, than the next generation of rail advocates? Um, all right, we can take it away now with the, the slides. Um, so we will do a brief presentation of our findings. Uh, the students have been working hard this semester and last semester. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we have approached this research, um, as well as handing it off to them to tell you what they've discovered so far. OK, a little bit about us. This course that I teach is in the UT School of Architecture in the City and Regional Planning Program. It is a practicum, so this is no more lecture time. They have uh, graduated beyond that. They are in the equivalent of 18th grade at this point. <laughs> So they're doing real work, and we try to make the projects as realistic as possible. As such, the students design their own approach to how they want to solve a problem. Uh, the final presentation for their research is May 2nd in Austin. Please do reach out if you're interested in coming. There will be more findings than are discussed today. Uh, this picture is just a few of the students. Um, this was a recent field trip uh, that we took. We went down the utility corridor that Texas Central has been looking at. We also looked at some of the freight corridors. And um, I mean, what better way to capture the moment than taking a picture in the utility corridor? Um, it, was, it was a good time, us and the cattle. Um, a little bit about who's joining me today. Uh, two students agreed to come and join me from Austin. I've got um, Connor Vanderhoek and <laughs> Adiba Nareen. And uh, we have done some self-experimenting here with our own ways of getting to Austin and Houston and Dallas. So we've tried the Amtrak train from Austin to Dallas, Vaughn Lane, Flix bus, I drove a 12-passenger van on the, I didn't think I needed my commercial driver's license, um, on our field trip. And uh, we are heading home in a Chrysler Pacifica. So we've really hit everything at this point. I want to talk just a moment about the mission that I gave the students in their research. Um, I wanted them to take a step back and look at the research from 10,000 foot level, but also in traditional transit planning education, we teach how to look at an alternatives analysis, and part of that is coming up with a traditional problem statement. We've got some great proposals from Amtrak and from Texas Central, but we don't see a lot out there about taking a step back, what is the problem that we are trying to solve, uh, first question to that problem statement is determine if Dallas and Houston should be connected by passenger rail. We had a hypothesis, of course. Um, and if so, which mode produces the most benefit? High-speed rail, high-performing rail, and conventional rail. Today you will see high-performing rail, uh, HPPR, because uh, in, in English grammar, Higher is, is more than high, and highest is even more than that. So we're taking it back to high performing because it is higher is actually more than high. So we're trying to correctly title um, the way that these things are. And uh, a little bit of that comes from the, the UPenn School of Thought on rightly naming things as they should be in English. Um, the second is to forget the actors for a moment. We certainly want to tip a, a hat to some of the great proposals that have been brought forth. But if you were to be writing a job description, we want you to think about the best candidate to be the developer, the best candidate to be the operator, and which attributes those players would have in making sure that Texans get some of the service that, that they rightly need between Dallas and Houston. Um, and lastly, build a policy roadmap with a nod to realistic politics. What this is about is a true recognition that 
there are not enough Republicans interested in helping to get this done. And what would it take to co-opt uh, Republicans into what is a nonpartisan topic? Um, just open, open that conversation up a little bit. So with that, I will move it over to my colleagues to talk a little bit about our research. Thank you, Meg. Let's get this. So again, my name's Connor Vandenhoek. I'm a student, graduate student uh, with the Community Regional Planning uh, Program. To just get um, the stuff out of the way, for things that were outside of our project scope, uh, we're not looking at precise station locations. I know that there's been stations that have been proposed, um, but we're not gonna look specifically at those stations where they are. Uh, we're not gonna talk about operational specifics. Uh, such as ticketing, timing, and we're also not going to give a prescriptive funding strategy. So you've heard a lot today uh, that Texas is a booming state, that DFW and Houston uh, are just growing at a monster rate, but to take a pause and just appreciate how large these metro areas are, uh, this is a map of DFW and Houston and everything in green are states with a smaller population than these two metro areas combined, which is pretty staggering. Um, went a little ahead. Uh, so again, you've heard throughout the day that our population is gonna be booming and very much in the short term as well. Uh, and with e-commerce, post-pandemic especially, and with nearshoring of moving factories uh, away from further out places to uh, more in our backyard in Mexico, these trade routes and freight, all of these routes are at capacity. Um, and so there's very much an urgent need to have an alternative to going from point A to point B. You also know that um, high-speed rail and rail generally is more environmentally friendly. Um, and that there's improvements with air quality and with climate change coming, there's not a better time to be looking at these alternative modes than now. We did wanna listen to some of the arguments that have been made about why high-speed rail can't work and uh, one of them being that previous attempts for high-speed rail in Texas between Dallas and Houston has been done before, um, has been attempted at least. This is also not a priority in a Republican-led state. Um, not that they're all necessarily opposed, but just that it's not a top priority. Texas also has a culture of private property ownership, uh, and this can run at odds with uh, eminent domain that's sometimes gonna need to be used for a project like this. The infrastructure costs are astronomical and out of control, and on a state level, we're not organized uh, to be doing this project currently. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Adiva. Thank you, Connor. Uh, hi, I'm Adiva. I'm also a graduate student in Community and Regional Program in UT Austin. And I'm going to talk about uh, what proposals that we uh, came up with uh, in our team and some cost-benefit analysis around those proposals. So uh, to plan for the intercity rail between Dallas and Houston, we didn't confine ourselves into high-speed rail only. We also looked around the viability of high-performing rail and conventional rail um, in this corridor. Uh, for the high-speed rail, we primarily explore the utility corridor proposed by Texas Central. And for high-performing rail and conventional rail, our proposals uh, look at um, having um, the use of existing freight companies uh, corridor and, or sharing their tracks for the conventional passenger rail. Uh, so here, is the menu of our proposals. We have come up with seven proposals. The first proposal is obviously the high-speed rail proposal, which is already proposed by the Texas Central. 
the second, third, and fourth proposals are hypothetical proposal put forward by the team, which is about high performance passenger rail. Uh, the second uh, options uh, considers having um, high performing rail on UP corridor. The third proposal considers having the high performing rail built on BNSF corridor. And the, and the fourth one is interesting. It considers building the high performing rail uh, on both of the freight companies' corridor, like sharing the corridor for, from both companies. And the fifth, sixth, and seventh proposals are on conventional rail, but these all follow the same principles that we did for our previous three proposals. Like for fifth proposals, our conventional rail will be uh, built on, like it will use the UP uh, line and the sixth proposal uh, considers having conventional rail on the BNSF line, and the last proposal is the conventional rail on collaborative alignment using both UP and BNSF line. So this is the map uh, that shows our option alignments. The red line is obviously, you know, which is the Texas Central high-speed rail uh, corridor using the utility corridor. The purple line is the BNSF corridor. Um, and the blue line uh, represents the UP corridor, and the green line is the collaborative uh, alignment that I talked about, which uses parts of UP, parts of BNSF uh, corridor, uh, as both of these corridors merge in Corsicana. So before I reveal our BCA ratio scores um, for these seven proposals I, I just described, um, just to give you an idea of what we considered on our benefit uh, spectrum, we used very high level analysis of our benefits. Um, we didn't get into much like technical uh, benefits calculation. What we considered is to get idea from what benefits coming from travel time savings. The savings can come from the, from the vehicles that stays on I-45 even if there is a rail. And there is also travel time savings for the people who shift from I-45 or airplanes and they go to the rail. The second benefit, it considers reduction in crash costs, which uh, occurs when people immediate, uh, permanently shift from I-45 to rail. The third benefit we consider is the reduced emission damage. Um, this savings comes from the vehicles which stays on I-45, even if there is a rail, and also there is also saving in reduced emission uh, when people move from I-45 or uh, airplanes to uh, rail options. And the fourth benefit that we considered is the savings on vehicle operating cost that we can have if people still remain on I-45, uh, even if there is a rail, and also the savings on vehicle operating cost when people permanently shift from I-45 to rail. So, um, so here is our summary of our BCA analysis. The top uh, rightmost column represents our B final BCA ratio. So before I get into the ratio, just to uh, give you some idea about our cost estimation that we used for our analysis, our team is still uh, working on getting a robust cost estimation using US DOD um, uh, standards and guidance. Uh, but for this preliminary analysis, uh, we use text dot um, capital cost for conventional rail uh, and Texas Central capital cost estimation for high-speed rail. And we discounted the high-speed rail cost um, estimation to get uh, the cost for a high-performing rail. And as you can see, the BC ratio shows definitely conventional rail wins. As we know, conventional rail, it requires very minimum cost compared to high-speed rail. Um, but then again, high-performing rail is not really doing good on this uh, table. Moving forward. Why we think, why we think high-performing rail is not worth pursuing? It, we feel that the capital cost is too high compared to the benefit that it offers. It's not 
it's not gonna offer the greatest speed that high-speed rail will offer, right? And also, if you are up to invest good amount of money for high-performing rail, why not add some money and invest it into high-speed rail? So we do not think high-performing high rail will be um, beneficial for the longer run, and also uh, the service delivery will not be up to the mark compared to the uh, high-speed rail. Uh, from our BC scores, we see the conventional rail wins. It does win in short term because, as I already said, there is loss cost involved, but there's also low benefits involved. Um, also, out of three proposals, we see that collaborative alignment option is the best option because it is the shorter um, alignment among all of those, and it offers less stops and shorter travel times. But still, I don't think conventional rail will be the getaway for us, right? So we do advocate for high-speed rail. Um, although the BC ratio uh, is less than one in case of high-speed rail, um, I would like to echo with what An Andy Byford said uh, in his presentation that it is about time that Texans should plan for uh, high-speed rail it's a long-term investment, right? But it will also help in getting um, greater ROI in long-term if we see it that way. And also, definitely, it has the potential of proving much better service delivery and better outcome in terms of performance. And also, it is the best option for inducing mega regional economic growth because as my uh, colleague Connor said, there is increasing demand for trade and also, uh, yeah, there is also e-commerce going, so high-speed rail is gonna do great uh, to induce all the potentials together. Um, so before I move on and get floor to uh, Connor, um, just to say we calculated only the benefits that are direct on this. We did not include the other indirect benefits that uh, high-speed rail also offers, like there will be economic agglomeration um, between these two giant cities, like Houston and Dallas, these are the giant metroplexes. The, if we introduce high-speed rail, there will be great agglomeration of economies, and also there will be labor force integration using the greater population densities from both those growth cities, and High speed rail also helps future proofing for growth in terms of sustainability. Um, it it's also offers ease of travel from users' perspective and comfort. And I think the last point is the interesting one because high speed rail could be like the best mode for transportation to transport people in times of calamity or natural disasters like hurricane. Or I don't know if you guys have seen. Um, Train to Busan movie, it's a Korean movie. So people were transported um, from a zombie attack to uh, using that uh, high-speed rail. So if not a zombie attack, we can save people use, uh, in terms of hurricane. So yeah, moving on, I'll give floor to Connor. Thank you. So one of the messages we really want to send now is that we should be thinking about how Lost the slide. Yeah, I'm a little taller. <laughs> um, one of the things that we really uh, advocate for is that we need to be thinking now about how we organize and fund uh, Texas high-speed rail between Dallas and Houston. So we're looking at governance structures and looking at several different high-speed rail authorities uh, successfully uh, around the world. We saw that having a central authority um, having a Texas High-Speed Rail Authority would be very beneficial, and separating that development with operation as well um, has been seen as a successful thing. And these funding sources, I'm not gonna list out the alphabet soup of the different ones. Um, you are all are very familiar with them, but the important message to send here is that there needs to be a readiness to accept those funds. Um, so having an advocate who's willing to go out and get uh, those funds on a state level, along with the uh, maturity and the ability to 
uh, use those funds is key. And some of the things that we can be doing now to uh, see this in the future is purchasing land for the future alignment, building trust with, uh, through partnerships with freight companies. Uh, anything is gonna probably involve freight companies in some way, so building those relationships now is key. And proving that the ridership is viable through conventional rail. Uh, leads to our final point is to crawl before walk and walk before run. So on a state level, we may not be organized or ready to be having high-speed rail today, but we can start by having conventional rail as soon as possible and develop and work towards high-speed rail as we get more sophisticated governance. And in the meantime, getting organized, building rapport with the key players, and building that capacity for high-speed rail is something worth doing now. And I'll hand it back to Meg. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I think this was a nice capstone on all of the sentiment and remarks we heard from the speakers the last couple of days. I want to thank the conference. And uh, I also want to end on a note that sums up what the students have found so far, which is that there is a way. Texas has two great cities city pairs and, and possibly even more that fit the obvious profile for a good candidate for high-speed rail. So there is a way. There's just not the will. And I would say outside of this room, there's not the will. Of course, this room's got the will. But it is our duty to start helping others understand the urgency behind some of this uh, need for governance and uh, centrifugal force within state policymakers to get things going. So I'll end on that note, and I want to thank the students for their hard work, um, taking the time out of other deadlines to make it, um, and for the conference organizers. Thanks. Wow. Well, you, you're looking really at our uh, future transportation planners, consultants, and experts up here. <laughs> this was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? We have one back there. Uh, where's our mic? And we have one over here. And where's our microphones at? Where's Chris? And we're going to put him to work today. <laughs> there we go, John. Thanks. Enjoyed the presentation, well done. I just wanted to know if um, in your study, did you take into account um, the interest in ridership for, pa for conventional passenger rail between Houston and Dallas, given that you'll be sharing the tracks with freight because the passenger service will never have right of way. And there's, a, there's sh surely between Houston and Dallas, there's high freight traffic density? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the team leader who <laughs> it worked on the BCA is not here, so I'll let Adiba fill in some of the blanks. But that goes to the last point that Connor made about developing better relationships with freight. Uh, one of the big findings is that freight needs help too. They're in this journey together. Uh, they really, <laughs> they are bursting at the seams. And it's not a good time to ask for some capacity from them. So what can we do? I, I, I enjoyed the speaker who talked a little bit about what NCT COG is doing to work with their freight and, and say, how can we help you? Look, we've got the know-how to do environmental studies. Maybe let us help you freight companies get that done and taken care of. Because you're right. The ridership is not going to be attractive if what would take three hours by car takes eight on train because you're constantly getting booted off by UP. So yeah, I, I hear you. Do you guys have anything to add to that? No, I think you covered uh, pretty much it. I don't know how to on my microphone, so yeah. Had another question from uh, over on this side. Uh, we'll need a microphone over here. Hang on just a moment. 
That way we can record your response and uh, get it out uh, when the videos come out. Here he comes. He's on the conventional route. Yes, my question is, uh, did your cost-benefit analysis consider the cost of doing nothing? Uh, we did uh, analyze it, but we didn't incorporate it in our proposal. We just incorporated the proposal with rails, not the no-build option. But in our, like, full spectrum of analysis, we did include that. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, just to add, uh, if you want to know, just come to our presentation on May 2nd, you're going to know a lot more. <laughs> so I'm not going to reveal everything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Don't give it all away. Thank you so much.